Hey Risen family and to anybody who is visiting us for the first time, uh, good morning and special welcome to all of you. Uh, my name is Martin and I serve as a pastor here at Risen. Uh, we've been worshiping online, uh, worshiping in this virtual space because of COVID for uh, quite a few months now and uh, long for the day that we can all be together once again. My, my encouragement is that we continue to be patient and that we would err uh, in love for one another in this season. Also, it's 4th of July weekend. I hope that you find this weekend to be restful, not just in the time off, but time with family and especially time with God. I would also be remiss if I were not to remind us uh, to acknowledge that while this day is a celebration of freedom and independence, um, we are a church that represents different cultural backgrounds, uh, that represents different um, historical perspectives. And so th while many of us are able to celebrate liberation and freedom and independence freely, uh, we have brothers and sisters whom this day might be a little bit more complicated. Um, the idea of independence come with a little bit more baggage. And so my encouragement there is that we would just be mindful of our brothers and sisters whom this day um, might come with a little bit more complexity. Also, as we begin to worship this morning, let me just read our call to worship from Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse 16. It says this, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us worship. You are Alpha. Yeah. 
Welcome to our Risen Church family. We know that this has been a long few months, and some of us are emotionally, physically, and spiritually tired. I hope and pray that this virtual gathering today will help refocus you on God's promises and renew your spirit. This is the time in our service that we call family time, where we extend the love and the peace of Jesus Christ to one another. Please take the time to do that now. It's a way that we confirm that it's Jesus who unites us as brothers and sisters in his name. And as you go about your week, please be compelled to continue to extend the love and compassion of Jesus everywhere you go. July, Hope for San Diego's Day of Service brings together hundreds of people from our community of church partners to serve throughout our city. Together, we put our faith into action for a one-day event to spark new energy for serving our community in the name of Christ. Day of Service is a powerful statement to our underserved neighbors that we see and care for them and that God loves them. That message will never change, even in the midst of a pandemic. So, our day for service spirit will be as strong as ever as we offer a variety of options for you to select based on your comfort level. We'll miss picnics and playing with kids, but many on-site projects will still take place, mostly at outdoor locations, with all appropriate safety measures, including smaller groups, multiple shifts, and protective gear. Anyone who prefers to surf from home may choose to hold a neighborhood food drive, help the helpers with encouraging gifts and cards, or assemble hygiene kits and blankets for the homeless. Please join us July 18th as we demonstrate to San Diego that we are still here, we still care, and there is still hope. Welcome to the round table. Uh, just some brief introductions for today. I am joined by Jessica Thompson to my right, Jessica Delgado across from me, and John Darrow to my left. Uh, welcome, uh, good to have you with us today. Last week we launched a new teaching series in the book of Revelation, and we said, and uh, those of us who are familiar with this book, we've said that this book is very strange. It's, uh, it's a book full of angels and demons and dragons and lambs and lions and tigers and bears. bears and to make sense of this book here's uh, what we said last week revelation is ultimately about worship uh, worship to the triune god and the writer most likely the apostle john gives us five sub themes under the main theme of worship and so we've identified these five themes and we went over it last week in our overview under the topic or main theme of worship we've identified the five sub themes as the following number one is devotion Number two, the supremacy of Jesus. Number three, judgment. Four, mission. And then fifth is the new creation. Each week we are going to be looking at each one of these themes and unpacking it. And so for today's roundtable, we will talk about the first one, devotion. And so as we talk about devotion today, I want to anchor our conversation, this roundtable conversation around Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, where it says this. Let me read it for us. It says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, 
who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This meditation on Jesus as the Alpha and Omega causes the writer, the author John, to break out into doxology, worship. So the very, picture, the very first image, picture that we have of Revelation uh, is, is worship, John worshiping. Um, that's the opening scene. And, and then the book, uh, John bookends Revelation with another image of worship, um, the wedding supper of the Lamb, which is, it's a picture of the great banquet that's to come where all of creation is worshiping God, the Alpha and the Omega. I mean, I think that's uh, that bookend that you mentioned between chapter one, verse eight and chapter 22 is absolutely central. Um, in fact, as we've kind of structured the five different topics that we're looking at this week, um, I was reminded of a, of a quote that I found that Revelation does not move from rapture to millennium, but from God to God. That's good. And that, that bookend there, I think, highlights exactly what our central focus should be as it pertains to devotion and worship in particular. I think another thing to think about is these words, this, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is, who was, and who is to come. Um, what he has done here for us, he, he was, he is, he is to come. He created the whole universe. He created us. He sent his son into the universe, into the world to redeem us, to bring us back to him. This was his whole mission to gather to himself a people. Chad Bird says this, he's the alpha of love. He's the mm. omega of grace. He is every combination of the letters of the alphabet that spells out the Father's will to save you. Mm -hmm. I think it's such a beautiful picture of who he is. Like he's the beginning and the end of our salvation. He's, he's everything in between. He does it all. And so because of that, um, we can look at him and say, yeah, the alpha and the omega, the alpha of love, the omega of grace, everything in between shows us that he came to save us. That's good it's crucial that we determine what John is saying about Jesus since the expectations for our behavior as disciples are based on the revelation of his identity as Lord, um, Jesus' identity as Lord. And so the early Christians saw through uh, John's vision, saw Jesus as the Alpha and the Omega as you have just alluded to or have described. And so this is one of the most comprehensive descriptions, uh, statements that Jesus is God anywhere in all of scripture. Um, so you've alluded to it, but let's unpack that a little bit more. What, what does the description Alpha and Omega about Jesus mean? Well, what I find interesting uh, about this particular statement is it actually begins earlier in chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, mm -hmm. and it's a thoroughly Trinitarian statement. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about the, the nature of God as followers of Jesus, we are thinking in Trinitarian terms, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So he begins in verse 4. He says, grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, and who is to come. Mm -hmm. And from the seven spirits, another way of translating that is the, the sevenfold spirit, kind of explain the, the fullness of, of the once Holy Spirit, um, before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Um, and what's also interesting, though, is that in verse 8, the, the, the very main focus that we're looking at is really highlighting the person of the Father. Really, that, that's who the, the I am is speaking of. But we can also see throughout, again, going back to verse 4, and then also looking through the rest of the opening chapter of, of Revelation, that it's actually drawing parallels back between the Father and the Son. So the who is in verses 4 and 8 is actually looking at the firstborn of the dead in Jesus in verse 5. The who was and the I am the Alpha in verse 4 and 8 is also looking at the I am the first in verse 17. Mm -hmm. um, the who is to come and the I am the omega, the end. Um, he is the one coming in the clouds. He is the last. We see that in verse 7 and 17. Um, and lastly, uh, his throne mentioned in verse 4 um, also connects to the fact that he's the ruler of the kings of the earth in verse 5. And that also has allusions to the book of Daniel. So like we mentioned last week, um, there's a connection to the Old Testament themes, especially the apocalyptic themes in the book of Daniel as well. So it's giving us a full picture, not only of, of God, but as God as revealed through Jesus. And John is very explicit in making those connections. So this statement, uh, Jesus claiming to be, or God claiming to be the Alpha and Omega, 
um, reminds us that our starting point and our ending point um, begins and ends with with God, right? Um, everything starts with Him. Um, he is our origin uh, of all things, not just ours, but creation itself. Uh, and same thing with uh, Jesus or God being uh, the end of all things. Everything uh, is an amen in Him. We, we amen in the name of Jesus because everything ends with Him. Every, it's all headed toward Him. He's the, uh, the omega point, right? The, the end point. Um, everything is for Him. Everything that's created is created for Him, for His glory, for His knowledge, and for His service. Meaning He's also then in charge of all of history. He's the sovereign Lord. All of history is going to Him. And this is important for us to remember in our worship because it's not just a our personal worship to God that is the beginning and the end. It's all of life, all of creation, all of the kingdoms, all every like everything, like all translates into all, right? Well, um, I also think that speaks to what Jess said in the quote that she had earlier. In that um, the Alpha and the Omega, I, I don't remember exactly what the quote was, but the aspect of it's not only the beginning and the end, but it's the beginning through the end, and how His presence permeates every, just as it permeates every letter of the Greek alphabet, mm -hmm. so it permeates every aspect of our lives. His presence is continuous mm -hmm. um, from beginning through to the end. That's a good point. He's not just the beginning point and the end point. He's also the middle, right. everything in between, and so this has. Um, implications for us at a personal level and, and I think corporate level as we think about who we are as the church. And so as we think about some personal application here, if, we're, if we want to take that statement, the Alpha and Omega, and how it applies to um, at an individual le level with our own relationship with God, what does that look like? Well, I think that one of the main questions that Revelation is really trying to help us answer is kind of like, what's the point, right? Um, if the point is, if the point of everything is my own personal happiness, then my life is going to be a reflection of that, mm. right? So whether we articulate the answer to that question or not, we're living in light of it. Mm. So if my, if the point of my life, again, is to be my own personal happiness, then Disneyland trips every weekend and Diet Coke um, on tap in my house, like all of the things, my life is going to be shaped around the answer mm -hmm. to this question, whether I want it to be or not, because I'm essentially living, I mean, we all live with mm -hmm. a point, right? Mm -hmm. But if it's Jesus, if Jesus is the point, which mm -hmm. is what John is telling us here, like, hey guys, wake up, Jesus is the point, then everything has to change. Mm -hmm. Everything is a movement toward him and not for what he can offer us, but for who he is because he is the end all omega point. Mm -hmm. So I think when we look, look at our lives and look at like what, how are we kind of in response to God in throughout our lives? I guess you could say like in our circumstances, like what's our um, posture toward yeah. God? And I think to what you're saying, well, well, you talked about how I just want to make myself comfortable or happy. I think we can do this with good things, too. Totally. So I'm going to be the best parent. Mm -hmm. If that's my starting point, mm -hmm. oh, my kids are going to be crushed under the weight of my expectations. Right. If my starting point is I'm going to be a good spouse, mm -hmm. you better believe my, my spouse will be crushed under the weight of my expectations. Right. Or I'm going to be even really great things. I'm going to be the best ally. Mm -hmm. I'm going to fight racism. Yeah. I'm going to fill in the blank all the good things that we should be doing that are right and good and we should be doing. If that's our starting point, right. we will. those things will end up controlling us and crushing us. Yeah. But if our starting point is, no, he's the alpha and the omega, mm -hmm. our starting point is him, that he was, he took care of our past, he takes care of, he is, he takes care of our present, he takes care of our future. He is to come. He takes care of it all. If that's our starting point, if Jesus himself mm -hmm. is our end goal, not be a better parent, person, mm -hmm. employee, whatever it is, if he's our starting goal, then we will be able to work towards that without either ending up proud, right. I'm just a good parent, why aren't you, <laughs> or in despair. Mm -hmm. My life is horrible because of my circumstances, and mm -hmm. I haven't lived up to being whatever that I should be. Mm -hmm. But if our starting point is Jesus... And our ending point is Jesus, and we get him in the in between. Mm -hmm. Every day we'll have the courage to try again, even mm -hmm. when we fail.
Hmm. Because what verse said, five says to him who loved us hmm. and freed us from our sins. Yeah. I think, too, something that we confuse a lot of the times is living like, uh, like we elected Jesus as Lord. Like, we're like, oh, yeah, you're the best option because you're, like, kind of a cool guy who, or, like, love your neighbor, and that's awesome. I love that. So I'm going to pick you. I'm going to follow you because I think that you kind of got it right. And there's a huge difference between the guy that we elected and the, the lamb that sits on the yeah. throne of mm. God, right? And if we live in light of that vision, this vision that John gives us, this revelation of, like, this is the guy that sits on the throne of heaven, that's a much different orientation to God and the way that we live our lives than some guy that we're just like, you're probably the best option. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Well, you both touch on uh, this idea that really choosing anything other than God as your alpha point, ultimately you're the one making that choice. So ultimately you're, you're saying that you're the alpha, right? But I am not the alpha. You're not the alpha. Jesus is the alpha. The only way to really know yourself and understand yourself is in light of who the alpha is. Mm. Um, How the world operates and the way the world actually is supposed to work is under the fact that Jesus is alpha. And when we try to live and restructure the world in any other way where Jesus is not the alpha, that's where ultimately that's a definition of sin. And that's where we see um, brokenness. And so the Bible says you'll never understand yourself, you'll never know yourself. Uh, unless you first know the Alpha, unless you first know God. Uh, You'll never understand what you look like unless you see yourself as He sees you through what He reveals through His Word. And that's why I think this is so significant. uh, God's Word is so important. Um, A true understanding of who we are is what God says about us, not what I think uh, I am or what other people say who I am, uh, but what God says true knowledge of self is knowledge of God. And unless you start with something outside of yourself, if you will, you'll never find yourself. Well, and I think that's actually a really important aspect of personal application as well throughout the entirety of um, the book of Revelation is if we look in verse three, twice he tells uh, the churches, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about that word blessed is it actually occurs um, seven times throughout the entirety of the book. Um, three of them talk about this focus of kind of encouraging through allegiance. And then the other four talk about the promise of a future reward. Mm. But that word blessed is a very key phrase throughout the entirety of the Bible. Mm -hmm. It starts most prominently in Psalm 1-1, where he talks about blessed are those. And then it continues on most notably, we we think of it through the Beatitudes of Matthew 5 and Luke 6. And so the blessed can sometimes be a tricky word. We often think in terms of blessings, things that we receive. Mm -hmm. But really the objective is what God is bestowing upon his people. And the idea from Old Testament to New Testament, Psalms, Gospels, Revelation, is the idea of a a theme that was very prevalent within Risen is that of of peace or shalom or flourishing. Mm -hmm. That's the blessedness. So a couple examples, if we look in uh, chapter 22, verse 7, he says, Look, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in the scroll. Well, that matches what we just read in verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Mm-hmm. So meditating, memorizing it, embodying, and not so much that, but embodying everything that this prophecy is saying in, is a guarantee of blessedness or flourishing. Um, but on the other side, the, the promise of a future reward in verse tw- uh, chapter 20, verse 6, blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power. So mm-hmm. longing for that resurrection hope. So the personal applica- application is, is here, but it's, it's a here and now. It's that longing for um, the presence of God, the new heavens, new earth, the ultimate hope of following Jesus. He is not the means to get something. A blessed life is getting Jesus. Mm-hmm. It's life with him. Um, it's life partaking in his kingdom. Um, and obviously that is possible through the sacrifice, the life, death, and sacrifice and resurrection uh, of Jesus himself. Um, and so it's, it's understanding that. And I think, how do you know what your alpha and omega point are? Like, what are those things that you're living for? I think it's a simple thing as um, identifying the things in our lives that if it was either threatened to be taken away from us 
how does that make us feel? Mm -hmm. Does it force us to go towards self-preservation and or try to do all these things to kind of um, get our life in order? I mean, we, we know what our hearts do in those moments when um, there's those things that we've hold on, held on too tightly are being threatened to be taken away. When our identity is threatened, those things that we that maybe are good things that we're placing above their rightful place, mm -hmm. we're giving them more importance than they need to be, whatever that identity is, if that identity is threatened if, in you, or if someone says to you, I don't know if you're doing that right, or however it's threatened in you, or uh, you, you hear someone saying something different than what you think, if you have an overreaction to that and you find yourself either really angry mm -hmm. or really sad, mm -hmm. either one of those sort of overreactions, I think that's when you know that your identity is wrapped up in who you are instead of in who Christ is and who he says you are. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a really important thing for us to identify those places in our lives where we kind of go off the rails with our emotions. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you're the type of person who just shuts down completely, either way. Yeah. Over-exaggerated emotion, shut down completely, either one of those extremes is when you, you will know that that is when your identity is being threatened. Mm -hmm. And you can tell yourself, oh, wait, I got, I'm forgetting about the alpha and the omega. I'm mm -hmm. forgetting about the one who is, and who was, and who is, and who is to come and I'm making it all about me instead. Mm -hmm. That's good. I think um, too, by way of application, um, to, to sort of scale back a little bit though, and to look at the fact that John is also communicating to the seven churches. Right. He's telling the seven churches in chapters two through three that, hey, this is your current situation. This is what it looks like for you to exist as a, as a community in the midst of a prevailing empire. Mm -hmm. This is where you've been doing really well. This is where you've been doing really bad. Mm -hmm. um, and then the rest of the, the book seems to shape and form around that, leading to the culmination of the end. So the question then is, what does this mean for the church of San Diego? What does mm -hmm. this mean for the church of Risen? How do we listen to the prophetic voice of Revelation, embody and listen to its message in light of what's happening today, and then apply it accordingly? One of the biggest themes in Revelation that's like not talked about is uh, Christ's display of nonviolence. Um, and I mean, throughout the whole book, you, we see violent imagery in this book, right? And that's apocalyptic literature for us, right? We're like, oh my gosh, what is happening? There's a dragon, there's a pregnant lady, what's going on? But I think that it's really important, and John is really stressing here to all of these churches, that the way to become a conqueror is to follow the lamb mm -hmm. into, into the new creation, right? right? But following the lamb means following the slaughtered lamb, which is, it's a life of nonviolence and, and restoration in that way, like not retaliating to your enemies is like, that's a huge deal mm -hmm. and something that's so counterintuitive for us. I think that the posture of the church toward power, yes, is to, um, to resist power, but to do so nonviolently. And that's a huge call for mm -hmm. us as the church, especially, we live high, we live in America. Like, we are all about revolutions and all of these things that glorify us. We have a really great narrative. Um, but at the end of the day, we are a people who are called to glorify the Lamb. And how do we do that but by following Him and His ways? Our identification is wrapped up in um, not just the slain lamb, but the risen way of this, uh, the resurrected Jesus, right? So as this even recapitulates the Beatitudes, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount is a picture of uh, the risen way of God's kingdom. And so God is showing us what it looks like to participate in God's kingdom as, um, as resurrected as resurrection people, right? That's what Revelation is inviting us into. Again, we're not preparing for an end. Right. Uh, God is preparing us for um, his kingdom. Um, and so, yes, the ways of Jesus of nonviolence is very important. 
for example, all throughout Revelation, um, John uh, has this idea of what the future looks like or what victory and, and what um, Jesus' victory looks like. And he thinks, it's, and many times we're tempted to think of it this way, um, it's some sort of military victory because that's how we think of power. But then in Jesus' revelation to him, he reveals himself as not as this military conqueror. Jesus reveals himself as the slain lamb, to your point, right? It's so counterintuitive to the ways of this world. It's actually incredibly subversive because Jesus is taking something that this world loves, like violence and power, um, and, you, and, and that's what Jesus uses to redeem this world. It's just this uh, repurposing of our ideas, our upside down ideas of, of power and strength. And, and Jesus says, no, I'll show you, I'll demonstrate for you what that looks like. And of course, that has implications for us as the church and how we want to follow the ways of Jesus. I think, too, you said something a while back in one of your sermons that, like, the kingdom of God comes like a seed, not like a boulder that right. smashes into this world, breaking everything to make way for the kingdom, right? It grows like a seed. It's inherently, like, peaceful. I think right now, especially, right, like, there's so much fear-mongering happening all over the place, and we are a people that live in this world, and we live in our cities, and, and we live in a context. Christianity and the church has always been in power here in this country, right? And, and our fear, I think, as a church in general, is that that power is going to go away, and we're going to have to, like, be a people oppressed by a certain culture. And I think that the answer is not to align ourselves more with power, but to reject it completely and love and take care of the poor and the marginalized and the um, undervalued people in our midst. Because ultimately the slain lamb, like yes, he wins, but he wins by not taking power. By rejection, do you mean the rejection of what we think power promises us in a worldly sense? I guess I should say repurpose power. Okay. It's rejecting a particular interpretation of yes. what power is supposed to do. Okay. That, right? Yeah, there it and is. And that's what it is. We this has come up a few times, but the image in Revelation 19 has been is come up in this discussion. But Revelation 19 before that is 17 and 18 where the true power, the I am, the Almighty, as he's described throughout Revelation, is fighting Babylon. Mm -hmm. Babylon is an image of Rome. I mean, mm -hmm. Babylon, arguably, is the greatest, most domineering, most violent, most bloodlust, thirsty mm -hmm. uh, uh, nation that's ever existed. And so Rome is now pictured in that. And the you mentioned it, this has come up a few times, is the word Lord. Mm -hmm. What we forget is how radically um, uh, subversive that term is in this context. Mm -hmm. uh, to say, you said it last week, to say that Jesus is Lord mm -hmm. is to say that Caesar is not. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is what that is saying. There, there's competition involved. And so if you're going to side on the side of Caesar, you're going to side on the side of Rome, you're going to side on the side of Babylon, mm -hmm. you are therefore not on the side of Yahweh. You're not on the side of Jesus. And so... Therefore, we have to look at the appropriation of power mm -hmm. accordingly. Um, Christians, especially American Christians, we tend to think very pragmatically. Mm -hmm. What works or what doesn't work? And that is our Americanism is interpreting the text. But right. Christians are not pragmatic people. We can't be, right? Our wisdom is foolishness to the world, mm -hmm. right? By definition, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians is, the, the cross is complete and utter foolishness. But we've accepted that as the true reality. And so if Jesus, as a slain lamb, has conquered through nonviolence, as I also believe the Revelation is saying, then to go back to, to the individual application of embodying and, and, and taking in um, and proclaiming the goodness of who Jesus is through the book of Revelation, then we too should be embodying that same kind of ethic of nonviolence. Um, and, but it's, it's very particular too. It's, it's, it's directed against power, mm -hmm. which doesn't make any sense, right? But it's not supposed to because 
we aren't conquering anything. God is conquering through Christ. He has already conquered, as you mentioned, we are resurrected people. He has already conquered through the cross and resurrection. It's already been accomplished, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. right? So I think that's a key distinction as well. So John's call to witness to that lordship is uh, the religious, it's the ethical, and it's the very political expectation that naturally follows, right? That's what we've been talking about. John is commissioned to write to the churches because their confidence is, gra is grounded in, in, in Christ's installation as a cosmic, uh, not just as Lord, but as judge, as priest, and as ruler of the church as a result of his resurrection, and we are partakers in that. Yeah. It's all of life, as we talked about. He, he is Lord of all of life, not just in a personal way, but all of creation, all of, um, all of the spaces that we inhabit. Yeah, absolutely. There's three words that you use in there. You use religious, ethical, and political. And I think most Christians do not have a problem with the religious or the ethical once we kind of work that out. But it's the political aspect mm -hmm. of following Jesus that American Christians in particular have a very, very difficult time with. Sure. And we understand that. We get that. Uh, I, I, I understand what people are coming from when they, when they want to push back. Because when they hear political, they hear partisan, right? They hear right. either an elephant or a donkey, and you got to align on one of those two sides. But that isn't what is happening politically in Revelation. What John is doing is he's distinguishing the churches um, as followers of the risen Lord as a distinct and unique politic that is, that is, again, distinct from the prevailing politic of Caesar in Rome at that time. Mm -hmm. And showing how there is, there's no continuity between the two. They're, they're, they're antithetical to one another. Right. Um, and so there's this, there's this quote from Michael Gorman. He says this. He says, Revelation, the book of Revelation, is therefore a theopolitical text. That is, it makes claims about who is truly God and about right and wrong connections between God and the socio-political order. It challenges the political theology of the empire and the religious ideology that underwrites it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of words in there. But all that to say is, as Americans, we are both very political and we are very religious. It's just determining which politic we are going to follow and right. which religious identity we are going to embody. Mm -hmm. John is making that very distinct through a lot of colorful imagery. But he's making it very distinct in the book of Revelation mm -hmm. in that our politic is that we are, we are living within a subversive community that is opposed to the community of the state. We are something different. We are something unique. We are living in light of the end. We have a hope and a blessedness that we can bring to the world that the empire cannot bring. And what helps us be centered in, in the right gospel politic is to proclaim the Alpha and the Omega. Mm -hmm at a personal level and as a, as a corporate level, um, remembering that in our personal worship, in our corporate worship, when we start with Jesus as Lord and our end point is Jesus as Lord, um, it, it centers us not on ourselves, it centers us not on those things that we think we have to live for, it centers us not on um, even our traditions, it centers us on Him mm -hmm. and Him alone. And this is why the topic of devotion is so important because the temptation to live for something else, whether it's a personal level, mm -hmm. in our parenting, in our ability to um, you know, be the best communicators or theologians or pastors in my case, or uh, you, know, you fill in the blank for, for yourself, uh, that temptation is real to, to live for that. Um, but that, that, that temptation at a corporate level is also the same. That's why we talked about um, nonviolence as, as a way of God's kingdom, because to live um, the ways of this world, the temptation is strong. The pull is strong to give our devotion to the things of this world. But when we proclaim that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, we are proclaiming that He is Lord. He is Lord of all. Yeah. And I mean, that is our, that's our vision statement. Right. It's all about, it starts with the gospel and it ends with the gospel. Yeah. It starts with who Jesus is and what he's done for us and it ends with us. The gospel renews, unites, and compels us. It does all those things on an individual level and a corporate level because of who he is and what he's done for us. We live as a forgiven and loved people. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to remember as we close here uh, that... Kind of like what Jess was saying, like sometimes we don't really know when we've let an idol take over our heart yeah. until we have a really terrible reaction to right. like 
not being the best cook or not being an excellent communicator like you were saying. And this book is a call for us, for the church, yeah. to come back to the God who's coming for us. Yeah. And so I think, I think there's a temptation to be discouraged for the fact that maybe we haven't been living our life hmm. in full devotion to the Lamb on the throne. Yeah. I know for me that that is very real. It's like, oh, dang it, I messed up again. I'm the worst Christian in the world. Right. But my identity isn't being a Christian. My identity is in Christ mm-hmm. and that He loves me. Mm-hmm. And so I think that it's important to remember that this book is calling us to really examine ourselves. And kind of like what you were saying earlier about how we can't really see ourselves until we look into something else. It's mm-hmm. almost like a mirror, right? right? If I look down, I have a six pack. And if I look in the mirror, I do not <laughs> have a six pack. <laughs> so sometimes we need to look at something else to see ourselves yeah. rightly. And and in this case, we're getting a vision of of the Christ, of the Messiah, of the one who was and is and is to come. And that should correct us. It should mm-hmm. it should call us out in all the ways that we've been unfaithful to the faithful one. Mm-hmm. And so I think if we're listening to this today, I know I was listening as you guys were all speaking and thinking, dang it, I'm really messing up here. Mm-hmm. That's that should be the case because we are unfaithful people yeah. loved by a faithful God. Yeah. Yeah. And so I hope that this is both an encouragement and a correction because yeah. it, it has been for me. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Um, thank you for being part of this conversation. Um, I think more importantly, thank you to God that he is a God of grace and mercy and compassion mm. over us. Yes, he's the Alpha and Omega who's Lord, but he's also the Lord who understands those very um, temptations and ways that we really have um, fallen into him, uh, the brokenness that we actually do live in. Mm. But the story doesn't end with us. The story ends with the Alpha and the Omega. Thank God for that. Amen. Well, Risen family, as we close our time of worship, uh, let me send us out and pronounce this blessing, um, uh, what we also call a benediction pronounce this blessing over you as we depart from this space. Risen family, may you know the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen.